Um, good afternoon. My name is Lee, uh, Lee Xiong. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present here. Uh, as Lucila mentioned, I do have the honor to have the longest title, so I took the liberty and shortened it for the slide. Um, so um, today what I'll do is to give a brief description of the two related projects uh, in collaboration with iDash on the topic of statistical and synthetic data sharing with differential privacy. So this is really under the setting of um, data sharing in the traditional model, as Lucilla mentioned in the very beginning, there's traditional model where we have data in the center and then we want to share the data with researchers and then there's also remote desktop cloud model and then there's secure multi-party computation distributed model. So here we're focused on the central model where we have the electronic health records that are available in the data warehouses and we want to share this with researchers so they can use this for medical research, but the privacy and confidentiality are the major barriers. Uh, for this kind of sharing. Um, so in current practice, uh, we can access the raw data with IRB uh, approval or set up certain uh, policies. Um, and the patients usually have uh, concerns or fear over their um, confidentiality loss or privacy loss. So this um, becomes a um, problem for, for them to be willing to consent uh, in addition to the overhead of IRB reviews and policy setups. So we recently also went through the whole IRB process in order to get the data for our research projects. So I understand there is actually a, a lot of overhead. Um, alternatively, there's also a de-identified um, data sharing approach where um, the institutions can share de-identified data, which is exempt from the HIPAA privacy rule, or um, can go through a more expedited um, IRB review process. So the data are de-identified in certain ways so that the sensitive information are being either, either sanitized or removed or generalized, so the resulting data can be shared with the researchers. However, uh, many studies have shown that this kind of sharing or de-identification really um, are subject to various disclosure or re-identification uh, attacks. And also there's lack of transparency and accountability in terms of the use of these kind of de-identified data. So uh, given these challenges, um, our real goal um, or holy grail is how we can share this kind of uh, data from data warehouses for enabling <laughs> research, but at the same time um, providing a rigorous guarantee so that we don't disclose any sensitive information about the patients. So we want to have the cake and we want to we want eat the cake, we want to have it. In other words, we want to share everything about our patients without sharing anything about our patients. Right? So towards that goal, uh, we have two related projects. Um, one is called SHARE, continuing with the um, acronym uh, tradition. It stands for Statistical and Synthetic Health Information Release with Differential Privacy. It's a linked R01 project supported by NIH uh, in collaboration with the iDash Center. Uh, we have a related project, Building Data Registries with Privacy and Confidentiality for PCOR, which is funded by the PCORI. Um, so we have uh, the same project team for both projects uh, with myself and uh, Dr. Andrew Post from Emory and Chi Long from Emory and uh, Dr. Chi, uh, Xiao Qianjiang and Lucila from uh, iDash. So I'll give a very brief description of these two projects. Um, the first one, share, here is an overview of the project. Um, so the black box is the, uh, the main component of share. So our goal is to develop a toolkit um, that would take the original health records and do some transformation and then share a set of pre-computed statistics or uh, a synthetic set of records that are consistent with the statistics that are similar or mimic the original data, which can be used by researchers for various exploratory analysis. Um, so our methodology is built mainly uh, on the differential privacy uh, framework. As I mentioned earlier, the traditional de-identification approach is subject to various uh, re-identification risks. So the differential privacy is a um, more and more widely used and recognized uh, framework for providing a rigorous and mathematically provable privacy guarantee. Uh, in the statistical privacy sense. So here I give you a very, very quick idea of what it means. Um, here we have a set of patient records, and our goal is to share a set of statistics. For example, in this case, a histogram of the number of patients um, that have HIV positive attribute for certain age groups or various age groups. Now, in order to provide a rigorous guarantee so that we don't disclose any individual record, um, if we simply just release this uh, histogram, and if an adversary has certain background knowledge of certain data records in the database, for example, and the top database does not have Alice, and the bottom database has Alice in it, by taking the difference between the two histograms, an adversary might be able to deduce Alice actually has a positive HIV positive uh, attribute. So the 
um, main intuition for differential privacy is to add calibrated noise to the counts of the histograms such that the statistics or the histograms are indistinguishable with respect to whether Alice is in a database or Alice is not in a database. So this is really nicely aligned with the patient's opt-in, opt-out principle. Right? Patients have the rights to opt-in or opt-out certain studies. So here what we're trying to guarantee is that it doesn't matter whether a patient opts-in or opts-out of the study, the statistical outcome of the study does not depend on the particular patient. So it will not disclose whether the uh, patient opts in or opt out of the database. So given this um, privacy guarantee, now our goal is to develop a toolkit that would um, build the statistics and synthetic data records satisfying this differential privacy uh, guarantee. However, in order to maximize the utility, the resulting utility of the data, we are taking a data-driven and application-driven approach because naturally we're adding the noise to the data. And a very the first question we usually get from the medical scientists is that, okay, you're adding the noise to the data. How useful is the data going to be? Is it going to replace the raw data? Right, so our answer is, after a lot of thinking and discussion, our answer is really, uh, it's very unlikely the differentially private generated data is going to replace the raw data. So it won't replace the raw data. Our vision for this, for the use of this kind of toolkit is that it's going to provide a um, pre-processing or a fast, uh, quick way to access a differentially private version of the data that derives statistics so that the researchers can do um, exploratory analysis and formulate their hypothesis and so on before they determine the real need to go through the lengthy IRB process to access the raw data. Um, so in order to do that, uh, we take the data-driven approach and looking at various different kinds of data, in particular the multidimensional data and sequential data, which are commonly used for cross-sectional studies and longitudinal studies, and we developed a set of algorithms that would allow us to build the statistics, which would be supporting or useful to support these kind of studies. Um, so just a couple of quick examples of the algorithms we have developed. So for multidimensional data, given the set of original data records, a um, very intuitive or direct way is to release an empirical distribution or histogram of the original data so that the histogram can be used for uh, supporting cohort discovery queries or for doing various predictive analysis and so on. Um, so the our, one of our first contribution is to develop such uh, histogram methods called DP cube, which just adds noise to the histogram so that the resulting histogram is differential private. But by uh, using various partitioning strategies of the data, we're able to achieve a good or optimal uh, utility for the data. However, these kind of histogram methods only works well for low dimensional data because if the number of dimensions gets high and if the domain of the data um, attributes gets large, then if we think about the histogram, the number of histogram bins is going to get very large and the counts is going to get very skewed. So by adding the noise to the counts, then the resulting data may not be very useful. So an alternative approach is to take a parametric method. Suppose we know the distribution of the data, then we can learn the parameters for that distribution and then add noise to the parameter of that distribution. That sounds very good. However, in real world, we may not know the real distribution of the data, or a lot of times it may not be represented uh, using closed form uh, distributions. So we have developed a to address that challenge, we have developed a semi-parametric method called DP copula. So the idea of this is to say all the region, all any kind of data can be modeled using two parts. One part is the marginal histograms of the data representing different attributes, and the other part is the correlations or dependence between the attributes, the pairwise attributes. So once we can model this data two separate two uh, parts separately, we're going to be able to learn a differentially or build differentially private histogram using the existing differential privacy um, based histogram methods, and then we're going to learn a dependence, for example, using certain um, parametric function like a Gaussian copula function, which represents the dependence using a Gaussian distribution. And we, if we learn that differentially in a differential private way, if we then combine these two parts, we can build a joint distribution or multidimensional um, data model for the original data, and then we can sample the records from that. So um, we tested this result, uh, th this method with various publicly available um, 
uh, data set, including the US census data, Brazilian census data, and so on. Um, so without going into the details of the uh, figure, really the point of these kind of figures is to show, okay, our line are better than other people's lines. But <laughs> um, so the takeaway message is say is that the DP copula really achieves lower error or better utility compared to other histogram-based methods, parametric and non-parametric um, methods. Um, so with that, we also realized, okay, so that's fine. That's very good for uh, if we have a set of data uh, from the data warehouse, we want to generate some synthetic records or histogram, we can do that. Um, but what if the data um, are being updated? Then every time there's some update to the data, we need to generate a new histogram or new set of synthetic records, right? If we do this in a naive way by applying the differential privacy noise every single time, then it's going to result in a very high accumulated perturbation error. So we then developed a dynamic approach that's based on a distance-based adaptive sampling, which really is to say at every single time point, we're going to evaluate how the data or how much the data has changed. If it changes a lot, then we there's a need to uh, release a new histogram or generate a new set of records. But if the change is very minor, is not significant, then we can ignore the change. Of course, we need to make the decision in a differential private way as well. When we make the decision, when we compute the distance and compare the distance with the threshold to see if it changes enough or significant, we need to make that uh, with the differential privacy noise as well. So that's uh, some of our recent results. Um, so that um, focusing on the um, multidimensional data for cross-sectional studies. Another common type of data uh, for clinical studies, especially for longitudinal studies, is the longitudinal uh, data, which involves um, repeated observations about a single patient, for example, his or her blood pressure history or genome sequences or encounters, hospital encounters, clinic encounters, and so on. So for these kind of data, uh, instead of maintaining the distribution of the data, the key thing for this kind of data is the sequential patterns, the temporal patterns that are important in the data, which we want to preserve. So in order to preserve this kind of um, pattern, we develop prefix tree-based approach, which represents the data using a prefix tree, where uh, we partition the data based on the sequences, and all the patients, for example, or all the records that have similar patterns will share the same prefix. And then we're going to add calibrated noise to this prefix tree to the count of the um, uh, prefix patterns and then release the differential private prefix tree. So this would allow us to preserve the sequential patterns in the data, especially the prefix patterns. However, we also soon realize that this is very good for prefix-based patterns. However, if we have very long sequences or if we have unsynchronized sequences because patient encounters happen at different time points, then it's, it becomes very hard to, to um, um, to address. So we developed an alternative approach, which is a um, pattern, ba pattern mining based approach. This is a very um, commonly used or seminal algorithm used in a data mining community for um, mining frequent patterns in sequential data. So here we can treat our um, patient encounter data or genome sequence data or longitudinal data as a set of se sequences. And what we want to preserve is the sequential or frequent sequential patterns. Um, so we can build our frequent patterns, for example, the K sequences from the frequent K minus 1 sequences. If A is frequent, then AB might be frequent, and then ABC might be frequent. So we grow the patterns in a level-wise approach, and then at every single um, level or iteration, we're going to add differentially private uh, noise to the count of those uh, sequences. And in this way, we can preserve or find the frequent patterns in a differentially private way, but at the same time, still preserve the accurate information about the count of the sequences. But then, of course, um, the drawback or limitation of this is that we only preserve the frequent patterns. And in a lot of times in the medical data research, we're actually interested in the rare patterns or uh, disease uh, that are rare, um, that are anomaly. So this kind of approach will not work for those. So again, there, we, we, show, we got some promising results for various approaches, but then there's always um, challenges that are open up um, that deserves um, more studies. So those are, um, these are again some results. I won't go into the details to the result. Um, um, so those are some of the methods or algorithms we have developed. A major component of our project is to really, we want to test and evaluate these methods on real medical data and see their uh, feasibility and utility um, uh, to use this data for medical research. So we are doing this kind of evaluation, both at UC San Diego and uh, Emory. 
Um, so both universities or institutions have the clinical data uh, warehouse for research, and we are extracting, currently the process of extracting the data from the period of 2007 to 2012, um, including both hospital and clinic encounter data, including the following set of data elements, such as demographics, hospital encounters, diagnosis codes, and so on. So the goal is to use this data and carry out two studies. One is the cohort discovery study. One is the 30-day readmission predictive study. So our um, um, goal is to compare the study result on the original data or de-identified data and on the shared process data, meaning the data that has a differential privacy guarantee. And then we can compare the results to see whether the uh, shared toolkit can preserve privacy, but at the same time provide reasonable utility for these kind of uh, research purposes, like cohort discovery and 30-day uh, readmission prediction. So that's our share project. Um, so we, this other second project I'm going to talk about is the PCORI, um, Building Data Registries with Privacy and Confidentiality for PCOR. So this is very much related and synergistic and complementary, I would say, to the share project. Because the methods we developed for share, they provide rigorous guarantees for privacy, and they provide utility for the res research and so on, hopefully. But they really just take a one-size-fits-all approach, meaning they assume all the patients have the same same kind of privacy concerns. But in reality, different patients may have different privacy concerns or different privacy risks. So in this project, we are focusing on the patient uh, centeredness, which means we want to empower the patients by analyzing and tracking their risks and communicate these risks to them, and then at the same time, allow them to make meaningful choices about their privacy choices. And then given these privacy choices and preferences, we want to build a data registry or build a data set by taking into account these fine-grained preferences. So one of our goal is to say, OK, um, there are some t patients who actually openly consent their data. If we can use this consented data in combination with the private data, we can build a data registry or data set uh, with a higher, much higher accuracy compared to the previous methods that just use private data alone. Right? Um, and another component is how we can actually evaluate and track the patient privacy risks as they participate in various studies, a lot of times multiple data studies, how we can accumulate the privacy risk and then communicate this with uh, the patients. So a major component of this research is the patient engagement. Um, so we have patient engagement and stakeholder panels. We have uh, Kathy Kim uh, as one of our advisory members and with the help um, from Deborah Peel, who is the patient privacy org uh, founder and director, we uh, assembled a set of um, patients and patient advocates as well as privacy officers at Emory and UCSD who serves on our panel, and we will meet regularly and um, figure out the best way or get the feedback from the patients to see how we can best communicate these um, privacy uh, risks and choices to our patients. So finally, I would like to acknowledge my students and my collaborators, but for privacy reasons, they are de-identified. But as you probably already figured out, <laughs> this is my uh, current set of students who are working on contributing to this project and some recent graduates and visitors. Uh, one of them I would like to point out, Luca, uh, who just graduated this summer, uh, just joined uh, IDASH as a postdoc, which is great. Um, so thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. And I, I noted uh, Howard Lee was one in, intern a year ago here, and so some papers were authored by her.